we're standing here on Mars with NASA's Curiosity rover. Okay, we're not really on Mars, and this is really Curiosity's sister robot, but we are at Curiosity's home base, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And while rovers like this one have captured the imagination of humans across the planet, scientists at JPL have even more ambitious goals, to one day have more than a billion human beings in space. My name is Scott Davidoff. I'm responsible for delivering the user interfaces for the systems that command the JPL spacecraft. And the challenge is that the next generation of rovers and exploration vehicles are going to be tasked with doing many, many things as opposed to just one thing. I mean, it sounds like you're describing basically remote controlled robotic avatars for people. Well, Sometimes that's what it's like, though the avatars aren't always like humanoid, and so the mapping isn't always as real, as, as natural as a hand to a hand. So what are the biggest challenges you're, you're facing right now trying to translate human embodiment to robot embodiment? Probably the hardest is the delicacy of certain manipulations, and then being able to not have a full picture of the environment. So what are you doing with Oculus? I'm going to show you three demos today. The first one is seeing through the eyes of the rover. So this is the first experience. We're showing you basically stereo paired image warped onto a uh, cylindrical display. You can see your, your arm, you can see the pebbles out in the distance. The more textured the environment, the more it really pops out at you. And from something like this, it's much easier to discern whether the object's in front of you or to the left or behind you, as opposed to just looking at it in a 2D window. This is incredible detail from these photos. Yeah. But hopefully you get a good feel of what it's like to be on Mars. Makes me want to take a hike here. <laughs> Now this is the International Space Station, so wow. we've taken all the U.S. modules, put them in here. All right, so I'm looking at this robot now. That's Robonaut 2. It's a humanoid robot astronaut that's on the space station to ha help astronauts do work. That's a copula. It's one of the windows to look outside. Whoa. Now you're outside. This is the entire space station. There you're looking at Earth. If you swim around enough, you can see the sun and the moon. This one's a little simpler. We're going to start you out at Gale Crater again, but this time it's a 3D interactive uh, environment. This is one of the ones where we think multiplayer could be really cool, is if a lot of people could be in the same environment uh, exploring that environment alongside this robotic avatar, which is our rover. It's very cool. I can just feel my stomach drop when I go up and down. So uh, we're standing here in front of one of the athletes, uh, one of the triathletes actually. Uh, athlete is a six-legged vehicle. It's actually two robots that combine together to make one six-legged vehicle. Right now we have it in, in, in the single three-legged uh, position. Uh, it was originally designed as a, as a multi-purpose robot to do things like cargo offloading uh, on the moon. So if you imagine you have a, a lunar lander that comes down and your cargo is usually on top of the lander, you need to get that cargo off the top. The two triathletes can come up alongside, pick that cargo up, move it to wherever you want, uh, and put that down. And what that enables you to do is to build a larger base on the moon from smaller pieces. Uh, one of the challenges of, of you know, landing on, a, on an asteroid is that asteroids have very low gravity. And if, if you come down, and as you come for a close approach, if you use your thrusters to slow yourself down, uh, you can kick up all kinds of dust and debris, and that will you know, confuse your sensors, um, cause all sorts of trouble. Uh, the other thing is that because they're low gravity, as you come down, you have a tendency to really, really bounce. And these bounces can have really long periods. Uh, and asteroids are, are generally on these, these really long uh, periodic orbits uh, of the sun. So you don't have that much time to do your science. Because if that asteroid's on a, on a 60 year uh, trajectory, you've got to land on that asteroid, do your science and get off. Otherwise, you're, you're not coming back for another 60 years. Believe it or not, landing a robot on an asteroid isn't the most difficult problem NASA has to solve. How do you control a robot that's so far away that it might take as much as 20 minutes for a signal to reach it? 
We have systems that help an operator to predict what the robot is going to do and understand the uncertainty in what it might accomplish. That's, that uncertainty is being introduced by that, that delay, but still accomplish their goals in an efficient fashion. This is a prototype that we've designed to allow people to control robotic spacecraft like the athlete uh, more intuitively. What's sort of unique about this demo is that it's rendering a 3D model in stereo, much like if you go to a 3D movie, you can see how things pop out at you. But one of the differences is it's actually tracking where I put my head, so it creates a much more holographic feel. And I have a pen here that's also tracked, and so I can reach into the space and I can actually grab the robot and manipulate it around. I can grab its limbs, so we have joint by joint control. So I can sort of fly the robot around, and I can grab a single limb and I can move a single joint. You click on its head, and then click on the ground. You can actually <laughs> laser things on the ground. So no demo would be complete without being able to fire the laser. <laughs> I'm feeling good about this trajectory. Uh, my name's Riley Avron, and I've been an intern here for now, this is my fourth summer. And you developed this iPhone app which makes this thing run. Yeah, exactly. So last summer, uh, that was my project. So they said to me, well, controlling this thing is kind of hard right now, um, and kind of confusing. It takes a while to teach people, and there are a lot of different parties who have an interest in, in driving the rover around. So making it you know, easy enough for like a media correspondent to drive is, is, a good, is a good thing for us to do. So they said, what's well, a good choice? Well, an iPhone is very ubiquitous. Uh, the lab hands them out if you don't have one. So you can, you can get one real easily. Uh, so we use the iPhone as, as our platform. If you guys have any positions open for rover pilots, <laughs> let me know. This is my resume. <laughs> So this is one of our robots. Uh, it's the lemur robot, and it has these uh, microspine claws. We use that to climb uh, rocks. It's the world's first rock climbing robot. This is a, uh, a microspine wheel. Uh, each of these little uh, uh, limbs here, or legs, uh, has a, a hook in it. Um, and those hooks grasp asperities in the surface, so little pits, ledges, bumps. Uh, protrusions and allow the, the robot to grip that surface and, and climb. The lemur robot is related to the, to the two-wheeled climber. Um, the difference here is that um, this robot, lemur, is designed to climb in any orientation. So it goes upside down, it goes on vertical walls, and we're also talking about using it for asteroids, which would be zero gravity. So that's kind of how they're related. This one is uh, we call it a power tool for astronauts. You know, drilling in microgravity is a really hard problem because uh, the normal drills that we would use on Mars uh, are not uh, able to be used in microgravity. There's no weight on bit. You know, normally when you drill, you're pushing into the surface. Mm -hmm. So on an asteroid with no gravity, you're just as likely to push yourself away as you are to push force onto the bit. And it gets even worse when you tr turn the drill on. Um, you're just as likely to start spinning around the drill <laughs> as the drill bit is to start spinning on the rock. You know, this is kind of an early stage prototype of, of what astronauts might one day use at, at an asteroid to acquire samples. Obviously, there's a lot of work to do before a billion humans are controlling robotic avatars on distant planets. But the work is beginning here. And someday, you might be an observer in space using technologies like those you might already have in your home including the Kinect, the Oculus Rift, or the Leap Motion. And if NASA's vision comes true, it won't just be robots or humans exploring space independently. It will be an intimate partnership between the two.